I'm Jace Laycob, and you're listening to Masterpiece Studio. Rolling hills, the smell of spring, driving through the dales with man's best friend. All creatures, great and small, never fails to deliver that ever-so-sweet bucolic charm. And as season four opens, James Harriet soaks it all in. That is, until he almost drives straight into Wesley Binks and his beloved dog, Duke. Oh! I'm so sorry. What way going? I'm very sorry. I took my eye for a second. Back at Skeldale House, Siegfried is predictably flustered. Whether he admits it or not, Tristan's absence weighs on him heavily. And it doesn't help that he's given up his beloved pipe for Lent. Even the smallest things seem to set Siegfried off. Oh, blast it. Put it on the list. Syrup of Cossilana. It's so bloody hard to put things back with the labels facing out. But in time, the warm-hearted support of family, friends, the surrounding community, and of course the animals, thaws both Wesley and Siegfried's icy facades. And Wesley even begins to show signs of a promising future in animal care. Who takes them all? Sorry? Well, the cats they're cooped up in this cage all day, they ain't right? They're only here until they're well enough to return to their own home. Well, they still need to run around. I'll let you discuss this with Mr. Harriet. Season 4 lead writer Jamie Crichton joins us this week to discuss themes of humor, love, new beginnings, and how he approached threading all of these endearing storylines together in Episode 1. And this week we are joined by All Creatures Great and Small lead writer Jamie Crichton. Welcome. Hey, Jace. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you doing, Jamie? Very well, thank you. Very well indeed. So you are no stranger to Masterpiece programs. You'd previously written on Grantchester and All Creatures Great and Small Series 3. You became the lead writer for Series 4 of All Creatures Great and Small. Uh, How did that new role come about? That is a good question. Well, it was mainly from having such an amazing time doing Episode 6 of Series 3, which I just adored loved the team loved the show loved everything about it frankly and I mean I think if my memory is correct I think they'd asked me if I was available to do an episode or two on a prospective series four which I bit their hand off um <laughs> and then the showrunner Ben Vanson got his own show greenlit and Melissa asked me if I would be interested in being the lead writer so I said yes please very much so so i mean it was absolutely the perfect show to sort of take that next step up the up the rung of the writing ladder because you know you couldn't wish for a a more nurturing and happier kind of environment on a show of course which i really just just literally worked on so i I knew a lot of the people on the show and i knew the characters and i knew the world took all of about half a second to make that decision. And I had the best time. I absolutely loved it. And looking at your CV, this this show and this time period would seem to be very much in your metier. Uh, As one of your specialties among many at the University of Warwick was World War II literature, uh, not to mention a previous A-level in history. Uh, does, Does all creatures feel like the perfect fusion of your interests in that way? Good research, James. Um, yeah, I've never really put those together in my mind before, the trajectory from A-level history to literature of World War II at Warwick. Yeah, I think I, I'm learning as I become more experienced as a writer, the things that I enjoy more and that I think I'm better at. And I think I do enjoy having a historical element to the writing I enjoy there being a little bit of research to get my teeth into so it's been fun sort of diving into different eras uh I think one of the things I've enjoyed most about all creatures is just that it shines a light on an era where so many of the simpler things the most beautiful things are things that we have almost unwittingly forgotten in the world that we live in now or that there's too many other things to distract us and we don't realize how important those simple things are whether it's the community or just the simple pleasures of life you know good food good friendship having a pint at the pub whatever it might be it's been so lovely 
diving into a show where those are the pillars that kind of hold the whole thing up and that you know that it's going to bring so much pleasure if you get it right to an audience who've lost that or who crave that or or even younger audiences who watch all creatures who have a connection with it and realize what a lovely time it was and how lovely those things are in life if that makes sense if i look back to what we were talking about in our very first writer's room you know we're just naturally inclined to try and pack loads of story into it and to see what actually we ended up with we stripped out so much and we just ended up thinking you know what that's a great story for the series not for that episode or you know or it we sort of call it the story shrinking machine that you sort of you <laughs> feed the plots through to try and strip them back and and therefore give them space to breathe as as writers and viewers we've almost become accustomed to yes the terrific pace to make you know people being terrified of of losing people's attention and therefore sort of throwing the kitchen sink at keeping it and it's been lovely to sort of realize that actually if you do something really well and you create characters that we really care about you want to see the small moments you want to see the little beats in in life and the little beats about that make relationships tick so it's been lovely in that respect just to take a a step back i'm just curious i mean before you joined the writing staff of all creatures in series three what was your own relationship with the alf white james harriet books was it something that you had a great deal of familiarity with ahead of time i have very vivid memories actually of of being on one particular holiday in in mallorca when i must have been about 10 or 11 and just coming into sort of a grumpy teenager adolescence (laughs) hadn't quite hit it yet but I, i remember not being one of be near any of my family just wanting to be on the beach reading and I read about five of these books back to back (laughs) I think that's all I did that entire holiday so yes I did have a very strong affinity with them I don't know to what extent they sort of had the same cultural impact in America but if you were to to say to pretty much any British person over the age of about 30 or 40 name a British vet they'll say James Harriet I mean so you, you've you written one episode at this point uh, of mm-hmm. All Creatures Great and Small. You get the call. You jump at the chance to become lead writer on Series 4. I mean, obviously, Ben is still an executive producer. He wrote this year's Christmas special slash finale. What sort of conversations did you have with Ben uh, ahead of moving into this new role? Well, I mean, first of all, he has been just the most extraordinarily giving mentor figure he's been just amazing and i was uh, and any nerves i had about filling his shoes and believe me there were there were plenty of those because (laughs) i just think he's done such an extraordinary job you know he couldn't have done more to allay those fears and make me feel comfortable so we we did several writers rooms with all of us together so Ben was a big part of all that and incredibly helpful. And, you know, he's been helpful as as an exec along the way, as a, a sounding board. In fact, it's been so helpful to have his, not just his fresh eyes, but obviously his hugely experienced eyes in an old creature sense to be able to sort of, you know, share a draft of an episode and just bring his voice in, say, what do you think of this? And do you have the same instincts that we do? And, you know, it's it's been just so lovely having such a great team. You know, there's, there's him and there's Melissa and just two of the best script editors you could possibly hope for, Alice Northey and Donna Metcalf. It's just been a joyous, joyous experience for me. And yes, if all TV jobs were as were as great <laughs> as this one, then uh, we'd be all be very lucky. You wrote the very first episode of this series, uh, Broodiness uh, is the episode title. And to me, it's such a perfect jewel box of an episode. It's so precisely crafted and it captures the the very essence and tone of the show. You know, you'd previously written these characters, but what were your aims with your first foray as lead writer with this episode? I mean, first of all, we can't really talk about this without sort of talking about the glaring absence of Triss in our world. You know, having him off at war is obviously going to change the dynamic of Scaledale and change everyone to a certain extent. This is going to sound paradoxical. It's the same, but different. It's the same world that we wanted to inhabit, but clearly there's a sense that things have moved on a bit. When we initially talked about, you know, what this season might be about, what was going to define this season, we kept coming back to ideas like accepting the 
changes that have been forced upon our our world as well as as well as finding the joy in in little things and and you know re- returning to core values in the in the face of change these are the sort of thematic discussions that we had but at the very beginning of this season at season four so we're in we're in early 1940 it's a sort of strange no man's land if you'll pardon the pun of war happening but not happening war has broken out and yet it hasn't really affected anyone in Darabi. aside from people being called up it hasn't made its presence felt so there's that sort of sense of trepidation of of terrible things going to happen soon but they're not really yet and it's not really encroached on our lives even things like rationing and 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 blackout blinds and all those kind of measures hadn't really fully taken uh, effect at this stage so it's it's a sort of strange hinterland of of being in the first year of war and and yet war not really having taken hold fully and it's it's easter it's a it's a time of rebirth and new beginnings i mean even somewhat thematically it's it's perfect both for the new beginning for these storylines within all creatures and also for the show under your helm how did you settle upon the the various storylines for this episode which all involve either letting go or new beginnings which is what parenting is really about Right. Yes. Very astute observations on your part. I'm glad that's what you took from it. Exactly what we'd hoped. Yeah. <laughs> the New Beginnings is, I mean, without spoiling too much, it's its not spoiling to say that James and Helena are in a strange limbo themselves. You know, Tristan has been called up and, and James has obviously signed up with the RAF, which has just meant by dint of how things worked out that he may never get call up papers, you know, signing up, putting your name down for the RAF doesn't mean you're going to be joining the RAF. It's easy to sort of fall into the trap of of hindsight and knowing exactly how long the war did last. It could go so many different ways. James could never be called up. He could be called up any day. The war could last for a few months. It could last for years. It could last for a decade. Nobody knows anything. So it's such a difficult time for a young, you know, newly married couple to work out what are they going to do you know do they want to start a family if they do start a family and then James does get called up immediately what does that mean and it's it's different from James's perspective as it is from Helen's perspective you know I think he's sort of slightly asking himself those questions thinking well is it quite a selfish thing to try for a child because if I get called up then I'm literally leaving my wife holding the baby and you know Helen's perspective is you know, might be slightly different. It might be, well, if he's going to get called up and I don't really want to imagine the worst, but you have to imagine that the worst might happen. If he doesn't come back, I want something of my husband. You know, I want I want some memory of him. So these kind of questions were the ones going through our heads when we were sort of plotting out how we might start the series of like, what would it look like? Do they want to have a child? Do they not want to start a family? And I mean, I think slightly deeper from from James's point of view, is he even father material? And I think there's, you know, it's it's not something that he's particularly comfortable talking about. But I think deep down, he has a fear that he's not a very good father or that he won't be a good father. And this is one of the things that we've tried to address with the animal story. You know, we always try and play everything through the animal stories in this show because it's about animals. So, yes, the dog story and the, and the story of the young boy in episode one is an attempt to try and show James that actually that there is a paternal side to him that that has been dormant or that he didn't really know was there. I just think it's a lovely story as it's played out. I do love that James sort of slots in between uh, Wesley Binks and Clifford Slavens, these two sort of parallel stories about either sort of being a child or being a parent uh, with James sort of considering becoming a, a father. And the Wesley Binks plot does take a significant departure from how it plays out in All Things Wise and Wonderful, where <laughs> the poor dog ends up dying from distemper, uh, giving both Wesley and Duke a, a much happier ending here than Alf White did. Uh, what was behind your decision to change the outcome of the dog story and Wesley's here? I mean, come on, Chase, we can't start with <laughs> killing a poor dog. That would have been too bleak as much as I'm being slightly flippant in saying that there's an element of truth in that. It's a quite a dark time 
even in even in as warm and cozy places as Scaledale, with these sort of forces looming in the background anyway. I mean, also, it ties in with what you're saying about hope for the future and what their future decisions would be. It felt entirely right that we could try and bring together those two stories, the Wesley Bink story and the story of Clifford Slavens, and, you know, and give us some hope. It's part of the DNA of the show, really using human connections to heal wounds and to bring hope. Yeah, it felt like the right decision and, and a sort of good marriage of those two themes. We get a happy ending. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I love the the final exchange at Clifford Slavin's farm between the two of them and the fact that the resolution of this entire situation involving Wesley Banks and Clifford Slavin has such a positive outcome for everyone involved. Uh, does this interaction with Wesley, is it the thing that perhaps then spurs James more strongly towards fatherhood? Do you think that without this interaction with Wesley, he might have still been more on the fence? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, yes, I think it's removed a subconscious barrier that perhaps he wasn't even fully aware of. He wouldn't necessarily articulate. He wouldn't either be aware of it enough or it's just not something that a man like James at that time would talk very openly about but I'm pretty sure you know there is this subconscious or unconscious barrier that he's been feeling that he just doesn't think he's got it in him he doesn't think he's he's a good enough dad and there is such a lovely relationship that those two have in this episode once he realizes he's got Wesley wrong and takes him under his wing it's so beautiful watching that relationship that you you can't help but get a a sort of flash forward of seeing what James Herriot the the father would be like and yeah he's going to be a great dad and Helen knows that all along so I think it's a pivotal moment for him I think in in realizing that yes he does want to start a family he does want to be a father before this next question a brief word from our sponsors Ocean voyages, expeditions, river journeys, Viking is dedicated to bringing travelers closer to the destination, offering a small ship experience and a shore excursion in every port. Learn more at viking.com. We talked about tone earlier. It might be difficult to find uh, that lovely humor when you have the war going on in the background, outside the Dales, of course, but it's still there, and and Tristan is away serving. James could be called up at any time. But this episode in particular shows off an almost sort of French farce-like potential of the the standing Skeldale house set and the, the comedic strengths of these actors. And it also reminds us that even without Tristan and even with the war on, there's still a lot of humor to be mined in this setting. How vital do you see humor being within all creatures, great and small? Oh, God, yeah, it's so, so important. We're always looking for the lightness in the stories, in the episodes. Some of it comes quite organically. You know, there there might be a story about a dog with an amusing complaint there might be something which automatically lends itself to lightheartedness to humor if there's not then yes we definitely try and find it because you've got to have the light and the shade without the humor the emotional beats don't land as hard or as powerfully and and actually often in the same scene you know there's something more powerful about having a really emotional strong even tear-jerking moment undercut with a light-hearted comment or a, we, we used to call them the sort of honeycutter moment a line that will underplay everything and make and bring a smile because apart from the fact it makes it sort of feel less worthy it's a sort of paradox it brings out the the, the emotional power of the deeper moment of the scene by raising a, a smile or a, or a laugh at the end of it so yeah it's a really important part of the series as a whole but yes even in episodes like this, which on the surface don't look like they're going to be full of laughs, um, you do try and find some, which, you know, there's the story about Helen being recruited by Siegfried to sort of help out and to order the veterinary supplies. And she gets annoyed with him for mistrusting her and says, if I do something, Siegfried, I'll do it properly. And then, of course, gets it slightly wrong. Uh, delivery for Fernan. Are you sure? 
What on earth is it? Uh, sterile dressings, it says here. I ordered six dozen rolls. No, you ordered six dozen boxes. There's six boxes in each one. And in an episode when Siegfried is being particularly cantankerous and grumpy, it does add to the fun of, you know, how do you hide your mistake from Siegfried when he's in one of these moods? So, yeah, there's, we, we, do look for, we do look for opportunities to bring in the humour. The answer to that is to hide them all over Skeldell House uh, yes, before Siegfried right. finds out, uh, which I, I love. And to me, it, it manages that moment not only to, to add humor, but as you say, to sort of build on the emotionality of what's happening here. We as an audience and these characters deeply feel Tristan's absence, uh, that sense of humor. And we feel the close quarters that all of these people are, are living and working within. Was this a rather winking way, perhaps, then, of putting Helen in Triss's usual dynamic with Siegfried? Yeah, I mean, I think over the course of the season as a whole, we've tried to fill the Tristan-shaped gap in a variety of different ways. I think we all agree. We're not going to just replace Tristan. We're not going to have another vet come in and basically be the new Tristan. We, that immediately instinctively felt wrong to everyone. What we did acknowledge was that Tristan's presence and what he brings to the show, you know, the humor, the mischief, it, it, we had to find a way of, of making sure we didn't lose that. So I think at different times over the course of the series, different characters do kind of step into that. You know, James's relationship with Siegfried changes slightly. You know, there's, there's a sense that because he's no longer got the Tristan buffer between him and Siegfried, he often has to sort of take on Triss's work and, you know, feels that he's now got the target on his back that he used to have before Tristan arrived. I mean, I think everyone misses Triss and everyone misses the fun that he brought. And I'm I'm definitely not saying the show is better without Tristan. It is not better without Tristan. But in many ways, what it does to the relationships is it allows them to breathe in a way that, you know, if you're writing an episode and Scaledale suddenly only has three or four characters in it as opposed to four or five that may not sound like much but it's a huge difference when you're writing it it suddenly gives you this space that you didn't realize that you had and could be so valuable to see how those relationships in Scaledale changes and I think what it shows more than anything else is that Scaledale itself as a sanctuary has its own kind of beating heart and and everything that it represents it's a port in the storm it's this sort of safe place that in and of itself offers refuge and has this kind of warmth to it that can't help but make people want to want to be there which yeah i think is is very important from an audience perspective as well you you really you really feel that i hope i what i love about it i think is as you say you do feel this tristan shaped hole uh the characters dynamics do morph i think a lot of shows would have sort of actively avoided invo- invoking tristan here but the show doesn't, without spoiling anything, his presence is felt and, a, and his absence is acknowledged in a meaningful way. And I think because of that, it does allow these relationships to sort of develop in interesting and unusual ways where, they, as you say, they couldn't have before. Um, but it still acknowledges that sort of that loss that these people would be feeling during this very turbulent time. Also in this episode, we we do see Siegfried at his usual level of sort of persnicketiness, uh, what with quitting tobacco and giving Helen hell about the supplies. I made a mistake with the order. A mistake? We've enough gauze to see out the decade. I'm sorry. I Where's don't... my tobacco? We also see a very different Siegfried in this episode as well. There's that, that really quiet show of tenderness as he sets down the cup of tea for Audrey. Yes, it must be hard to... Dredge all that stuff up. Well, it's between Robert and me. No one else. Sometimes we have to look that monster right in the face. Show we're not afraid of it anymore. Well, it's not that I don't want to. Because I do. Desperately. Well, why didn't you use my study? I promise you, once it's done, you'll feel like a new woman. I can see to it that you're not disturbed. Is that Siegfried perhaps at his most compassionate, most supportive? Oh, I love that scene. I mean, I think that is such a 
beautiful distillation of what this show is. It's a show where bringing another character a cup of tea can speak volumes, you know, can say more than any beautifully written line could ever say. It's it's the little gestures that make big waves in our show. So, yeah, I think, again, without sort of going too deep into that storyline, there are questions about, for all of our characters about the past and about the future and about reconciling i mean for mrs hall you know reconciling her feelings for gerald of course we ended season three with a big moment when when she and gerald kissed so you know for mrs hall reconciling her feelings for gerald with the fact that she's she's a married woman and a devout christian her story across the series asks questions which pertain to that, as well as how she fits into Scaledale, where her heart is, and those kinds of questions. And for Siegfried, it's not just about coping without his infuriating but beloved brother around. It's about working out who he is and where he is in his life and who the important people are in his life and what makes him tick and what makes Scaledale Scaledale and I think by the end of the series those questions have become a lot clearer in his mind shall we say yeah I mean there there is an inherent tension in all creatures between altruism and looking after oneself James puts everyone else first often at the expense of his own well-being Tristan tries to sort out who he is independent of Siegfried Mrs. Hall puts off exploring a romantic relationship with Gerald initially because she made an oath before God. Siegfried does his best to look after those he loves, though it's often at everyone else's expense. Is there an overall message All Creatures is offering in regard to this? Is is it better to put others first or is it best to look after yourself? It's a very good question. Having Having lived and breathed All Creatures world for a year or two, it feels like it is a place where it's all about altruism it feels like every character ultimately has more of an altruistic view of the world than most contemporary characters you'd see and i think that's partly what makes it an appealing show to watch because that that kind of altruism is rarer than we would like it to be perhaps you know again back to the community back to the popping around to a neighbor's for a cup of sugar or, you know, the sense of community, the looking out for each other, looking out for neighbors, making sure that everyone is okay, I think is such an important part of the show. And it's so often played through the animals. I mean, the animals give such a great opportunity to play, especially with slightly stoical Yorkshire characters, give an opportunity to play sort of unexpected emotional stories and i think that's also another part of why the show resonates with a lot of people it's so easy to forget that animals play such an important part in so many people's lives whether it's the family dog or the family cat or whether it's an old lady or an old man living on their own and their pet is the only living creature in their lives and it means so much to them it's often easy to forget how important that relationship is. So, yeah, I think there's something that's so uplifting about that, about the human-animal relationships. This is a show that is phenomenally successful on both sides of the Atlantic. Why do you think ultimately these stories connect so palpably with audiences in the 2020s? What is it about these specific stories that resonates so sharply with audiences today? Yeah, I think first and foremost, given the abundance of programs that you can now watch across all the various platforms, there aren't many that have the heart, that have the level of comfort that All Creatures has. There are other genres that are so well served and shows that offer comfort viewing and that give you all the warm feelings that All Creatures does are few and far between. And I think what people love about All Creatures, and this is all credit to, this is Ben Benson. He created the show as it is and and created 
the characters and the DNA and the tone, which is almost the hardest thing to come up with. And I think he understood that what so many people crave is not just harking back to simpler times. It's not the simplicity. It's not just the community or the warmth. It's the whole package. It's understanding that relationships, that caring for one another, that looking out for one another, that bringing somebody a cup of tea and giving them some privacy can be such an important and emotionally wonderful thing to do. TV lives, I think, largely in sort of large, big moments. This is a show that sort of lives in small human moments of connection. Mm. I mean, I could I could speak for another hour with you, Jamie, because uh, we've just scratched the surface. There's so much more I want to ask you about, but I will end by just uh, asking what is next for you? There's nothing I can talk about yet, but um, sorry if that's a boring answer. I'll tell you what I'll be doing on, on Christmas Eve in the UK, though, or a few days before Christmas Eve, and that is getting myself a cup of tea, sitting down and watching the uh, the Christmas episode on television. There's something so gorgeous about watching it here and that with Christmas closing in and putting your feet up and uh, just embracing all the all the Christmassy feels that an All Creatures Christmas special gives you. So I'm very much looking forward to Ben's um, amazing episode. I will say I did watch it the other night uh, with a cup of tea uh, under the lights of our Christmas tree, which is up uh, in our front window, and it was uh, magical. So there you go. You know how to do it. I know how to do it. Jamie Crichton, thank you so very much. Thank you, Jay. It's been a pleasure. Next time, the controlled chaos of Skeldell House has met its match when a new arrival turns up at the practice. Have you come far? Oh, uh, from Broughton. I've just finished at Henshaw's, the feed merchants. Oh. Secretary, clerk and assistant to the manager. Tune in next week for our conversation with all creatures great and small actor, Neve McIntosh. Masterpiece Studio is hosted by me, Jay Slaycob, produced by Jack Pombriant, and edited by Robin Bissett. Paul Stevens is our sound designer. The executive producer for Masterpiece is Suzanne Simpson. Music